will be your mistress of ceremonies today, your facilitator if you like. Uh, also welcome to everyone who's watching on our live stream and um, we welcome you from all over the country to be a part of Raising Films Forum. Before we get started, of course, I want to acknowledge that the Afters campus is located on the land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation and we acknowledge all traditional owners across the lands of Australia, past, present and future. We particularly welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today, including any elders. Thank you so much for coming and we're always very grateful to be delivering um, in information and education on country. Uh, I'm really honoured to be your MC today. You can see from the biography that I am a creative uh, industries expert, but I think it's also prudent to point out that I'm also a screen practitioner, an afters graduate and a mother. Uh, and so today, talking about access and inclusion for parents and carers in our industry um, is timely and I'm thrilled to be a part of Raising Films. Uh, I'd like to start the proceedings by welcoming Megan Riakos up to introduce today and WIFT and a little bit more about how things are going to run today. Thanks, Megan. So welcome today. Uh, my name's Megan. I'm the president of Women in Film TV New South Wales and board member of the new WIFT Australia. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the Raising Films Australia Screen Industry Forum. And I'd like to thank each of you who came here in person today, as well as to those at our five satellite sites across Australia, including Perth, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide and Canberra. And of course, those of you who are tuning in online from your workplace or at home. So last year, we here at WIFT uh, mounted the Safer Workplace Strategies Forum to start the work of cultural and structural change around sexual harassment in the workplace. This year, almost one year on to the day, we are mounting the Raising Films Australia Screen Industry Forum again to start the work of cultural and structural change, this time to create a more accessible and carer-friendly industry. Both of these issues play a huge part in gender inequity, which is why they have been such a big focus for us here at WIFT. In February 2018, WIFT set up Raising Films Australia. Uh, it was in recognition of the enormous impact that caring responsibilities are having on participation in the Australian screen industry. And this initiative is based on the UK organisation Raising Films and the work they've undertaken in their region for the last three years. In May 2018, the Raising Films Australia Screen Industry Survey was launched in collaboration with the University of Technology, Sydney, and we received over 600 responses. I think this shows us just how important this issue is to a lot of people in our industry. The six-page survey summary report uh, that came out of that survey was released in October with immediate effect. The South Australian Film Corporation announced a raft of initiatives uh, that we'll be hearing about a little bit later from uh, Courtney from uh, SAFC. Um, and one month later, we launched the full report alongside the Screen Forever Crash, again supported by SAFC, Create New South Wales and SPA. Um, and this was inspired by the original Gold Coast Film Festival Crash that we'll also be hearing more about today and was spurred on by the work that Raising Films had started earlier this year. So the report, the creches, the initiatives, um, these announcements are the first steps towards bringing awareness and change for carers in the Australian screen industry. And this forum now is the next step. It's a vital that the industry as a whole work together on these important issues and recognise that no one organisation has all the answers, nor should a singular part of the sector be charged with solving the issues. This also means that it shouldn't fall to the carers, which are predominantly women, to bear the burden of this change. Whether you are a carer or not, we must all as individuals, as professionals, as employers and colleagues, take responsibility for the cultural change required. So that never again does a carer have to hide the fact that they have kids or they have a sibling to look after because they are worried it will affect their ability to get work. Our industry has a lot to learn, but this forum will provide a space for a long overdue conversation around the challenges and obstacles and drive strategies to address them. Consider today a taste tester of sorts. We've got a whole lot of really great speakers. We don't have as much time as I'd love for each of them, but I think it'll give us all a really good overview of where our industry stands and some inspiration and resources to make it better. Um, we'd also like to thank the, uh, the following key partners and sponsors. If we could just move to the sponsor slide. Um, 
The following key partners and sponsors who've made this forum possible, including Screen Australia, Create New South Wales, the Australian Film Television Radio School, Screen West and AI Media. We are also really grateful for the wider support from our academic and industry sponsors, University of Technology Sydney, Western Sydney University, Griffith University, South Australian Film Corporation, Screen Queensland, Film Victoria, Screen Canberra, Australian Cinematographers Society, Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance, Australian Screen Sound Guild, Australian Guild of Screen Composers, Casting Guild of Australia, Australian Production Design Guild, Australian Directors Guild and ASDAX, and Australian Screen Editors and The Orchid. And I think that list there, that list there shows that there is definitely a will to change our industry. And I'm really, really glad that there's such collegiate support around this issue. So we'd love you to share uh, news of this report via your networks and social media using our hashtag, hashtag RaisingFilmsAU. So thanks again for coming along today. Um, we really look forward to continuing this discussion um, and building a better industry for all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. Now we are just going to have to alter the run sheet uh, ever so slightly. We're going to start off proceedings by getting our first panel up to discuss the report findings. Uh, so I would like to welcome up uh, Professor Deb Verhoeven, Dr Sheree Gregory and Margaret McHugh to come and discuss the findings and this uh, panel will be facilitated by Megan and moderated by Megan again. So please welcome our panellists. While Deb's setting up there, I'll just quickly introduce the panel. So we've got Margaret McHugh from UTS, uh, Dr. Cherie Gregory from Western Sydney University, and uh, Professor Deb Verhoeven from University of Technology, Sydney. So the, the other slides, in charge. Um, Alan, just switch to, I think if you... Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, so just a little bit of a... Um, intro to how this survey came about. So obviously the UK organisation um, Raising Films, uh, they did a survey the previous year and we used that as a structure for us to then bring it to Australia. So it was really great to partner with them. Um, and, and then Deb and I sat together and figured out what, how we should put the questions for an Australian audience. So do you want to go from there, Deb? Sure. Um, is this on? Can you hear me at the back? Yes. I want to set the bigger picture before we get into the detailed discussion of the responses in the survey. So the first thing I want to say is thank you to anyone in this room who happened to fill out the survey. Seriously, thank you. Because this is one of the most over-surveyed industries I have ever seen in my life. Okay? We've been collecting data forever. And you'll know this if you work in production, the amount of data that's collected around even just the activity of making a film is copious. What happens with that data? Not much, really. And that's why I really thank you, because it's very easy in these circumstances to get survey fatigue and to think, why bother? Why bother filling out another survey? Because nothing changes anyway. Right? Nobody actually really cares about the data or about my experiences of being in this industry. And I think you would be actually um, uh, confirmed in your thinking if you thought along those lines. And I'm going to show you why. What I want to do for the next minute is think about how, as an industry, we face the evidence. What is the story of the data that we don't already know? How do we not make this yet another survey that tells us bad news so that we put our heads in the sand or we only develop responses that look like we're taking notice but we're not really getting to the heart of the problem? Okay. Is it enough to say we care by wearing ribbons at a ceremony when we can't even organise a crèche. Okay. Is that enough? Is that caring? What constitutes care in this context? I think not, notwithstanding the SAFC's almost immediate response to this particular survey, uh, we need to actually think seriously about the risks and liabilities of continuing to gather data that doesn't change anything. Um, so what I want to do is just have a quick look at some of the parts of the report that we haven't uh, given you in the documentation to date, which is the last half of the survey. The last half of the survey dealt quite broadly with experiences of the industry 
And we put that there deliberately because what we wanted to do is compare your experience of the industry to previous surveys that have been taken in Australia. So not, not comparing to the UK survey, the Raising Film survey, but to previous surveys that were conducted in this country in 1983, 1987 and 1992. And here are the results. How many people had unpleasant, how many women had unpleasant experiences because of their gender? Okay, in 2018, 46 people in the survey this year reported that they'd had unpleasant experiences that they thought were due to their gender. In 1987, it was 52%. Have we really improved as an industry over 30 years? We already knew that. We knew 30 years ago that gender was a significant factor in women's experiences of the industry. What do we do about it? How many people thought they were disadvantaged because of their gender? Okay, we had 31% of women this year. 1992 was a particularly bad year. Okay. In my opinion, this is willful negligence on the part of the people responsible for addressing these issues. The evidence is clear. It's historically reverberating through this industry and we're not redressing it effectively. Part of what I'd like to get out of today is a sense of how we can actually grapple with these issues more meaningfully. And so I really hope that part of this notion of care is about thinking about what we do with the evidence. How do we respond with care? to the information that we have delivered to us and that we have at hand. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the actual um, answers that people gave around these two, two concepts later. So that's the longitudinal analysis. What about a kind of vertical contemplation of care? How do we think about the concept of care and amplify that so that we have a stronger sense of what care might mean in this industry? I think this is a brutally callous and uncaring industry. I think, as I just said, there's been active negligence over 30 years. And this is for an industry that prides itself on enterprise and creativity, singularly lacking in imagination and ethical depth. Alternatives to the current system, policies that provide alternatives are rare and usually opportunistic and place the onus for change on those people most vulnerable. The most vulnerable people in our survey, as it turns out, are people with cold backgrounds who are single parents and working as freelancers. And yet they are the ones we are constantly asking to change their behaviours to accommodate the industry, not the other way around. How do we shift that? What is it that the film industry, in a sense, exists for? What does the film industry take care of, if we can use a phrase like that? What is the problem that having a funded film industry solves? If we think about creative industries then being not so much about disruption, which is the perpetual breaking of things, but is the current flavour of argument for having an industry, but if we rethink the industry as being about care, what is it about the world that is broken that the film industry repairs? Why should anyone care about this industry? How do we communicate that what we do, or what we think we do, matters? These are really critical questions. If we don't get to the bottom of care in this industry, we find it very hard for other people to care about us. Okay? So this is a huge conversation. It's not just a conversation about organising a creche. Okay? It's a conversation about what really matters and what kind of world we think we should work in, but also produce for other people to experience through our work. Carers generally <clears throat> keep things running quietly in the background. They're typically um, faced with lack of recognition, and I think that came out very strongly in the survey. To research care, to even say we need to care more about caring, is in and of itself an act of that repairing, an act of change. It's, it's a way of connecting threads and mending gaps and listening to the language that's held in those silences that's held by those people that aren't heard 
that just operate in the background, putting things together, making things work. The freelance single parent called background people that we find in our survey. We perpetuate harmful practices and long-standing injustices when we fail to care. Paid childcare, um, which comes up a lot in the survey as a potential solution, could be a solution, but if we really cared, maybe we'd also think about how paid childcare shifts the burden of care often onto people even more vulnerable than the people we think we're solving the problem for. Migrant workers, for example, often end up being the ones that are outsourced to do the care when we engage in paid childcare. So paid childcare might be an interesting solution, but it doesn't actually solve the fundamental problem of care in the industry. It's a short gap solution that takes vulnerable women away from their children in order for other women who are less vulnerable to have access to work. Okay? So I want us to think really holistically about care, not just we need to solve this particular problem today in this particular moment. I think we need to focus on the idea of the, the social world that we exist in as an industry and think about something close to what I might, I can't think of the, the right way of describing this, a kind of cinematic citizenship, a citizenship of the screen industries and think about what that might mean rather than focusing on the broken objects of the film industry which are of course the films that we constantly talk about that film didn't work we need to adjust policy here to fix those films this is not about the underused or under rewarded films this is about the broken social and political relationships that characterize this industry okay it's the relationships what we make tangible what we say is the problem or is broken is not the films, or it should not be the films, it should be the relationships. If we don't do this, we place a debt burden on future generations in this industry because the cost of fixing those broken systems amplifies every single time we fail to fix it. It gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. I'm going to finish up um, just contemplating something around uh, a little extract from a Sarah Ahmed um, moment where she talks about in the cultural politics of emotion her mother's chronic pain and her need to think about her relationship to her mother in, in terms of care. And she says that what she needed to do was um, bear witness and actually see and make tangible the pain, right? And I think this is what I'm trying to talk about. We need to make tangible those silences, the hidden caring work that happens in this industry. By granting her mother's pain the status of an event or a happening in the world, rather than just something that was felt or something that would come and go, she was able to give witness and make that experience take shape in the world and become tangible. That's what I want our evidence to do. That's what I want this survey to do, to make tangible the hidden work of caring that is going on and the pain that is caused to those people who have to do it without recognition and who do it in defiance of an uncaring industry. Okay. So I'm now going to sound like I'm an unreconstructed hosier song, but it's not the song, it's the singing, right? It's not the films, it's the filming. It's not making content, it's making content. That's what I think we should aim for. And that's my aspiration for this survey. Thanks. Um, Deb's been working in this field for a number of years um, and I think it's really important for us to look back at those previous longitudinal um, surveys and acknowledge um, what, work, what, what works and what hasn't been working. And I think a really big thing around that is in regards to um, we, what we haven't done over the last 35 years is cultural change. <laughs> cultural and structural change. We can bring in these initiatives that work for, for that moment, but once those initiatives stop, if you, we don't make these other changes, then they're not going to have a long-term effect. Um, so next I'd love to um, have welcome Dr. Sheree Gregory up to the, present her qualitative findings of the report. So, um, you know, this film was a, a survey. mostly, a, a, this survey, <laughs> this survey was, um, uh, a combination of, of quantitative and qualitative, and we were really lucky to get Cherie to come in um, and and look over all of those long responses that we got from our uh, respondents. So.
Thanks, Megan, and thank you, uh, Professor Verhoeven. Um, just before we um, start discussing the report findings, I wanted to set the context um, about how we got to this situation in Australia, uh, and particularly um, why uh, there, there may not have been uh, so much change or, or um, uh, fast or, or quick change as we'd like. So I'd like to talk about, um, uh, just briefly, the connections between inequality between gender and caring and to set the scene about work and family life in the Australian context. So what we know now is that there's substantial research which, which suggests that being a carer, so uh, a parent or caring for another family member, uh, as well as a worker, um, has a much bigger impact on women and their employment rates, their employment transitions, their employment status over time than it does on men. This research also says that uh, it's more likely that women as carers will face barriers when trying to combine paid work and care, and that this situation is unlikely to disappear in the immediate future, particularly if, if we're, we don't act. So it's clear, for example, that combining work, uh, so paid work and unpaid care, has two main effects. So one is economic, and the other is to do with the quality of caring that, that women can do. So firstly, uh, Craig and others have noted that those with domestic caring responsibilities, who are primarily women uh, and mothers or carers, they spend less time in the paid workforce across their lifetime. So put another way, caring leads to discontinuous employment, it can reduce women's income over the life course, it has impacts on superannuation and retirement savings. So for example, in Australia, survey data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which is some of our best available data uh, around paid work, it shows that women's paid work participation hours decrease at the birth of a child, uh, and that's when women withdraw from paid work for um, a period of time, and then it increases again with the age of the youngest child in the household. So depending on an individual or on an, a household's situation, um, depending on their paid work opportunities and the legal framework of work, uh, women face varying barriers if they want to return to paid work after a period of, uh, of leave, of time away. So women's paid work participation is also more fluid throughout the life course, particularly from around the time of childbirth. And childbirth, in short, has immediate and far-reaching consequences for income and, as I mentioned, overall lifetime earnings, the ability to build up superannuation contributions or make retirement savings. Undertaking paid work commitments raises a major challenge for any person who has to take time out of the paid workforce to care for a child or uh, an adult family member. So firstly, the economic costs, which you would have heard as the, um, the care penalty. They fall disproportionately to women, and subsequently this raises additional key problems and demonstrates the clear connections between gender inequality and caring. So these economic impacts are felt by mothers more than fathers, um, and also more than childless women or men. And secondly, paid work participation has a negative impact on the caring work that, that women do um, because paid work time cuts into caring time. And the guilt associated with, uh, for example, dropping the baby um, in order to go to work, so getting things organised in order, getting care organised and, and maybe stopping care or pausing care in order to go to work, is now well documented. So the social impact is quite complex. The community and media may treat the choices that women make to seek paid employment as evidence of a decline in women's commitment to caring, but it's quite a fine juggling act. They, this may feed into the way that women encounter negative messages from peers, from colleagues, family, when they return to paid work after having time away from ch for childbirth. So, for example, experienced at work, this may include receiving inappropriate or negative comments or missing out on training or development opportunities. And these types of negative attitudes about family life were raised uh, among survey respondents in the Raising Films Australia screen survey. So that there are some negative attitudes uh, towards having children uh, was one um, finding that came out. 
So historically, one of the most critical policies in Australia, if we're looking at work and family, um, has actually been quite recent. Um, and it's not without politics, contention and difficulties. And that was the introduction of government funded paid parental leave scheme. And in the mid-2010, the then Labor government announced it would be introducing a new national 18-week paid parental leave scheme to commence from January 2011. And so despite the scheme being based on minimum wage standards, it was a major policy change after 30 years of campaign, campaigns by union and women groups, uh, women's groups and advocates. So also related to um, our, our key policy around uh, managing work and family, but not part of it, um, are schemes around stay in touch programs, return to work um, uh, part uh, also as part of the policy, uh, which are built around an assumption of um, the importance of female participation in the paid workforce. So it's not enough just to have policy. Um, we also need to have a culture uh, around um, attitudes and around inclusiveness and also programs um, that work together. Two or three generations ago, women in Australia often withdrew from paid work so as to manage the expectations that they had to do the household work and also take charge of caring responsibility. Whereas today, women's paid work and care is much more diverse and arguably much more complex and contradictory. The visibility of carers in paid work has increased dramatically uh, over the past four decades in Australia. Um, and there's also been significant changes to the ways that Australian families look and work. There's been changes in our households. However, while there have been significant changes in work and family life, uh, including the ways in which women make decisions about the best combination of paid work and caring, there's also evidence that the so-called work and life balance has been both a precarious accomplishment and one that has been achieved at some cost, especially to women. So structural constraints are illustrated in the dilemma for women uh, who want to fulfil the expectation of having an attachment to the paid workforce, something um, which often they've uh, spent a lot of time and money investing in training uh, in, in, in their vocations, uh, and also as well as fulfilling their role uh, as, as being a carer or a parent in the home. So we have also in Australia an ideal worker model and a long hours work culture that creates a context which is increasingly at odds with caring uh, and the caring work that many women do. Uh, and these are some of the invisible or silent dimensions of caring uh, that Professor Verhoeven uh, was also um, alluding to. A way to understand work and care and how we got here is to recognise that there are two models occurring. So we've got on the one hand an ideal worker norm and a marginalised carer norm and these are gendered. And these are organising structures of the, the social practice uh, of caring and of women as carers and um, historically uh, of men as working um, as breadwinners and uh, ideal workers. So perhaps then the key to reconciling this work and family conflict is to transform the conditions that produce it, particularly the way that we organise work and family um, and these organising structures of in any given in, uh, industry, um, what is an ideal director, what is an ideal writer, um, who are they, um, what, how many hours do, do, do they work? Who do we think of when we're thinking about an ideal director? So uh, it's about changing those imaginings um, for, for that to be a little bit more diverse and, and open. So the ideal worker, um, just quickly, it, it, it's a norm that works in two ways. So first of all, there's an idealised paid worker. So uh, it describes an employee who works long hours or full time or can work long hours, is available, can also be available for overtime um, and is unencumbered by family responsibilities or caring and um, often has the, the support of a full time partner uh, at home. Um, the ideal carer, however, is uh, those with caregiving responsibilities who are marginalised because they can't perform like the ideal worker. So, um, consequently, 
Margin the marginalisation of carers um, is almost, almost always describing uh, women. Uh, it rests on um, their exclusion from particular ideal worker model uh, in the workplace because they do not and they, they can't fit um, the ideal worker gender norms. Um, however, men are expected to perform as ideal workers and it's assumed that this is also their preference and choice and they might be viewed as going against that norm. For example, if they'd like to become a stay-at-home carer, if they'd like to take parental leave, if they'd like to take part-time employment. So there are advantages and disadvantages by going against these types of representations and stereotypes. Um, that have, have uh, been reproduced um, over a long period of time. So there are some assumptions here um, that limits men's ability to operate as carers and reinforces their advantage in the workforce, and the same with women. Um, and these social forces are, what sh are shaping experiences and they're reproducing uh, and reinforcing these norms. So there are disadvantages when individuals challenge, resist or move outside of this type of framework and kind of going against the, the grain. It helps us to make sense of the screen industry experiences of, of parents and carers. Um, and another thing that's going on uh, is that, uh, as Professor Verhoeven noted, that change is slow. So next year in 2019, it's going to mark three decades since um, quite a well-known sociologist, Ali Hochschild, in the United States. Um, in 1989, she argued that the feminist revolution initiated by the second wave feminist movement, which was the late 60s, that that had stalled. But one of the factors that seems to be playing quite a considerable part in constraining change is the powerful, um, our powerful ideas um, around um, care and our ideas about who should care um, and, and how that should be supported. But looking at the workplace is only half of the picture. The other half, we have to look at our households and how work is organised in our households. And we also have to look in, uh, at our communities as well. And if women are to enjoy much more genuine choice um, about the way that they want to live their lives, shape their lives, and if they're to be supported to achieve those choices, then it's critical that more attention is paid to what goes on in the community and household, as well as um, looking at structures within uh, the workplaces, as these things are all interconnected. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there and then we can open up discussion of the findings. Thank you. Set up some slides just with some basic stats that um, each of you would have been given the summary report in, when you arrived today. So um, there is a bigger 40 page version of that that we will have at the round tables and we've got them. So if you want to check it out, otherwise they're online. Um, but I'll speak to those in a minute. But in the meantime, um, I just wanted to chat a little bit about um, some of the questions in this survey um, were similar to questions that we had in those earlier um, surveys from the 80s and 90s. Um, so Margaret and Deb went through and did a correlation between those different surveys. I mean, what, what did you find? Uh, nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reasons given in the, the kind of um, more discursive parts of the surveys were very similar um, for uh, the, the experience of um, discrimination and bias. Um, Margaret, you might want to chip in because I feel like I've talked a lot. Yeah, um, sort of like one of between the 83, the 87, 92 and 8, 2018, um, long hours was one of the biggest issues that carers and had faced in the industry, which of course goes back to it being a freelance industry, but there being the inab inability to sort of organise care, um, shooting on locations, being away, um, was an issue that was constantly noted. And financial insecurity, so not sort of being able to have a regular income, the financial costs of um, childcare, and inability to access childcare out of hours. So if you were asked to work, with, and you indeed sometimes need to work overtime, having access to childcare during the evenings or early mornings um, was a big problem as well. Yeah. Great. Um, well, not great, actually. <laughs> um, totally not great. Um, so I'll just get um, some slides up here. 
I'll just whiz through these really quickly. Like I said, you guys have got these um, also in there. So, you know, key findings, 74% of our respondents state caring has a negative impact on their role in the industry. I mean, that's staggering. Um, that has a huge impact on whether or not people choose to even have kids. If they have kids, whether or not they stay in the industry. I mean, all this stuff is really important and we're going to hear a lot from other speakers um, throughout today around this issue, so I won't go too far into it. Um, also, there's a huge number of carers of freelance. So, um, you know, we, it is important for us to look at um, traditional employment structures, but we also have to look at the way freelancers interact. So our industry does have that as a unique factor um, compared to you know, what a, a lot of other industries are doing in this space. And the fact that 73% find it impossible to difficult to vary the hours and amount of pay, paid care that they access. Um, you know, we're in an industry where we like to think that we're flexible, but we're actually the opposite of flexible. We're flexible for the production, but we are not flexible. So, um, you know, when you get the phone call the day before that the call time's changed, what do you do with your care um, responsibilities? I think that's a really big, really big thing to talk about. Um, I will, won't, won't go through these. These are in your, your guidelines. These are the challenges and solutions that our respondents came up with. So these are overall um, from, from all the respondents who wrote back. So obviously long hours and weeks is the top. Financial uncertainty and solutions are around, you know, um, care being provided in line items of the budget or part-time and flexible roles. Um, but I also want to look at, um, oh, this is in the full survey report, so it's not in your summary, but I know there's a lot of guilds here today um, that you might be interested in looking at your particular guild's um, key challenges. I thought you said guilt. Yeah. Guilds. <laughs> there's a lot of guilt here today. <laughs> I'm guilty. <laughs> you got me. Um, so uh, that's online. We'll also have them at the round table. So if you want to look more closely at those, and these are the solutions also um, by job type. So there's a lot of similarity in them, but obviously somebody who's working, um, you know, in finance and funding is going to have different needs to somebody who's working on set. Um, Recommendations. So we have a list of recommendations in, our, in the su summary that you've got there. These are wide recommendations. Like I said at the start, it's not WIFT's responsibility to tell the industry what to do. We're here to facilitate a discussion and we want the industry to come up with the best solutions um, that we can find. And no one solution is going to be right. It's going to need multiple pronged approach because as we said previously, depending upon what your role, you're going to need different things. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at there. We, we might have time for one or two very brief questions. Um, does anyone have anything they want to chat about now? I should also mention that we will, the researchers will be around during the roundtable discussion as well. So if you want to speak more to them, uh, there's the opportunity there too. Got one question up the back there? Um, any other questions? Yep, Fiona. We'll just wait for the microphone for the live stream, if that's okay. Sorry about that. A very <laughs> simple one. What does cold stand for? Culturally and linguistically diverse. Yep. Any other questions? I think we'll leave it there. Um, one comment before you. One quick comment. Uh, just um, in terms of how the survey was undertaken, to let you know that neither Shireen nor I get paid to do this sort of work. This is on top of our day jobs. Um, and we involved our students in this as well. So there's one person who's not here, which is Erin Jolly, who did this, um, did all the data analysis and the visual, data visualizations and the layout as part of a master's course she was undertaking at UTS. But again, well and above what was required by the course um, in terms of time commitment and intellectual commitment and passion. So I just wanted to recognise that these uh, surveys or surveys like this come out of a particular place of caring as well. And Erin, um, you know, is juggling full-time work and has a kid and studying.
So, you know, um, a lot of this stuff, when we talk about not putting the burden um, on the people who have the least power, I mean, in this, in this instance, it was, we felt it was strongly enough that it was important to put our time into it. But I think moving forward, we as an industry should bolster this. Yep. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to acknowledge very quickly is the limitations of this survey. So um, it, it was predominantly um, responded to by parents. Uh, we need to do more research in regards to other kinds of care. And we also need to look further into the intersectional impacts. So although we were able to measure the cold um, uh, ramific like ramifications of intersectionality in that instance, you know, there were other um, LGBTIQ and disability um, and as well as um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, we just didn't get the high enough volume numbers for us to be able to um, they were not robust enough for us, for us to be able to use. So I think in this next iteration of um, uh, work that we do, we'll be looking at how we can find more information in those areas. Um, but f for, for now, thank you. Um, and like I said, we will be around if you want to chat further. Uh, thank you so much to our panellists. Um, because we're on a tight time schedule today, I won't be able to introduce everybody um, with all of the details that they deserve, but I would urge you to either have a look at their biographies for those of you who are here live, and for those of you who are watching the live stream, uh, down, you can download their biographies to find out more about all of our incredible panellists, and you can also download the, um, the brief version of the report. I know as a mum and a filmmaker, reading through this report was like looking in a mirror. Um, a mirror stained with grubby child fingers <laughs> and although um, a lot of it for me personally was disheartening, I also just felt so incredibly grateful that we were finally going to have an open conversation about this. So, uh, Although I mentioned that we don't, I'm not going to have time to introduce everybody, I would very much like to introduce our uh, keynote speaker. Uh, Although I don't think Jocelyn Morehouse requires an introduction, to be completely honest, and I will be having a slight fangirl moment later. <laughs> I just thought I'd reveal that now. <laughs> um, Jocelyn's had an incredibly rich career, which uh, I'm sure you can all read about and uh, we can all find out more about it, uh, including, of course, Making Proof, her first feature film, and writing and directing The Dressmaker and the work that she did in the US. But I believe she's also here as well to talk to us about her new book, Unconditional Love, which is coming out on the 2nd of April. And I urge you all to pre-order that so that you, a, a few copies, <laughs> two or three, you know, uh, so that you can uh, find out more about her experiences. Please uh, join me in welcoming Jocelyn up to the mic. going to have to put my laptop here. <laughs> Didn't get to print it out. A little busy this morning. Um, that's all right. I'll just sort of balance it here. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be invited to speak to you today. I'm a writer and director of movies and television. Some of the films I have either written, produced or directed include Proof, Muriel's Wedding, Unconditional Love, which, I know, which is referenced in my book, um, How to Make an American Quilt, Peter Pan, Mental and the Dressmaker. <clears throat> I have wanted to be a writer-director since I was a young girl. It was that or become a composer or an orchestra conductor. I was very lucky that my parents believed in me and raised me to believe that I would have a career. My mother had a career, she was a school teacher, but she also wrote articles for newspapers and poems and stories for her own pleasure. Now, I was never a mumsy type. My girlhood dreams were of living an adventurous life, of finding my calling and excelling in whatever career I chose. I never ruled out the possibility of having kids, of course, one day, just like my mum. But my theoretical motherhood hardly ever entered my thoughts. I preferred cats, really. <laughs> When it came to human babies, I usually tried to avoid them. I had a morbid fear they might cry or wet their pants or worse, poop their pants. I had no idea how to change a nappy or, or wipe a baby's bum and no desire to learn these skills. At 18, when all of my friends were babysitting, I was earning extra cash teaching piano lessons. 
anything to avoid childcare. I had a boyfriend and we would stay up late dreaming of what he would be when we were both all grown up. He was going to be a successful jazz musician. I was going to be a director. I was going to direct movies. I forced my family members and friends to act in my surrealist Super 8 movies. <laughs> <laughs> I went to film school, this film school, <laughs> uh, where I met Jane Campion and Alex Proyas and my future husband, PJ Hogan and Wendy. Um, oh, now I've lost my spot staring at Wendy. Hang on. <laughs> we made student films together and after film school began to search for ways to break into the Australian film industry. One of my first paying jobs was as a script editor at Crawford Productions. Some of you might have heard of that place. Uh, depends how old you are. Um, it was in Melbourne and that was where I worked on shows like The Venerable Flying Doctors um, and The Completely Forgotten Primetime. But all the while, I was secretly working on a feature film script, an odd story about a blind photographer. It gave me joy to work on an idea that had erupted from my subconscious, and it was all my own. PJ and I got married in 1988, and at the age of 29, I experienced what seemed like two astonishing miracles. The first miracle, I got a film financed. Mm -hmm. The Australian Film Commission and Film Victoria liked my feature script, which I had now titled Proof. A month later, I discovered I was three months pregnant <laughs> with my first child. That was the second miracle. Um, I lost my spot again, sorry. My first thought was, how wonderful. My second thought was, there goes my movie. I can't possibly have both a baby and a spectacular career break. Life didn't work that way, did it? I assumed that as soon as the Australian Film Commission discovered that I was pregnant, they would take my funding away and give it to someone who was not pregnant. Uh, I assumed that I would be forced to choose between being a mother and being a film director. Why did I think that? Well, it was 1989, remember. The Berlin Wall was still standing. The Simpsons was in its first season and the number of Australian female film directors was minimal probably could count on one hand. Uh, a lot smaller than, than those numbers are now. Times were different. Yes, feminism was well established by 1989, but the idea of being a big-bellied pregnant woman giving orders on a film set just didn't compute. Times have thankfully changed since then, and I have absolutely given orders on a film set while hugely pregnant. But back then, I was still feeling outrageously lucky that I had a career at all. It was harder for women to get a foothold in the industry back then. As for leadership positions, very difficult. So the concept of adding motherhood to my status as a woman seemed to be rocking the boat a little too much. I spoke to Cathy Robinson and Peter Sainsbury at the AFC about my dilemma, and to my surprise, they agreed the funding for proof would be waiting for me when I went back to work after giving birth. Linda House came on board to be Proof's producer. We formed the company House and Morehouse, deliberately cute. <laughs> and we set about planning the production of the film. Meanwhile, my husband PJ and I went broke from not having any work. We could no longer afford to pay our rent. We had to move in with my sister, Kathy, while we tried to find employment. We both got some writing gigs. PJ wrote some television and I got a commission from the Women's Weekly to write a romantic novel. <laughs> which I did, under a pseudonym, and I won't tell <laughs> We applied for unemployment benefits. It was a tragic sight, really, at Centrelink, standing in the doll queue with my big belly. We met with the employment officer who declared we were pretty useless when it came to work skills. Don't you have any other qualifications? She asked appalled. No, we answered. All we know how to do is make movies. Linda and I continued to have meetings throughout my pregnancy. And once my baby boy Dowie, later to rename himself Spike, was born, <laughs> Linda would sit with me in his nursery while I nursed my baby in a rocking chair. Linda, amazing human that she was and is, accepted that I was sleep deprived and hormonal and a complete wreck of a woman. But she saw through all that and she saw me as a talented director she wanted to work with. Linda kept persevering with her early pre-production meetings, 
helping me select heads of department at possible locations. If needed, she and Tony, Tony Mahood, her partner, uh, even babysat little Dowie so I could attend meetings. Linda and Tony continued to believe in me as a director, and that was a wonderful gift to me. Without that belief, the movie Proof would never have been made, and I would never have had a career. Baby Dowie had been born by emergency C-section. As a result, I was unable to bathe him or change his nappy for the first couple of weeks. Instead, while I was dosed up on morphine and learning how to breastfeed, my husband PJ took on all the other caregiver duties. After we left the hospital, he had to teach me how to bathe my son, how to change Dowie's nappy, and I had to adjust to this new role of motherhood. Motherhood. The most primal, emotional, back-breaking and heart-bursting role I have ever taken on. I thought I knew what to expect, but becoming a mother was an all-encompassing tsunami of brand new feelings, brand new fears. My body looked as if it had been stretched and twisted and slashed open, which it had. The lactating hormones surging through my blood provided me with incredible boobs, <laughs> the likes I had never seen in my mirror but also changed my personality on an hourly basis. <laughs> I had so much milk, I had to learn how to milk myself, yes, like a cow, with the assistance of a weird, wheezing, pumping machine. This was so I could give the milk to PJ for night feed so that I could sleep occasionally. You see, if I didn't sleep, I couldn't think straight. I wept at the drop of a hat. <laughs> I was a very strange person. PJ was very supportive and took turns with me, getting up at night and feeding baby Dowie with the expressed milk. He did this with all our kids. When Dowie was four months old, Linda insisted we begin auditions. She told our casting director, Greg Apps, that baby Dowie would be coming to casting sessions and needed to be slotted in every four hours between auditions. Later, Dowie accompanied us on location scouts until he got bored with all the driving around. During this time period, PJ was trying to write his screenplay for Muriel's wedding. 1990 was a very challenging time for both of us. Eventually, we decided to hire Ruth, a nanny, to work eight hours a day. It was an odd feeling, trusting my child with a woman we barely knew, but there was no other solution. And so began a lifelong emotional and financial balancing act that continues even today. Can I still be a great mum if I'm not there at home all the time? How much money will I have to live on after taxes and nanny fees? I can tell you because I did the math. Ruth's fee took up 72% of my directing fee on proof, after tax. Yes, 72% of my net fee. Was it worth it? Yes, because proof went on to be very successful and launched my international career in filmmaking. Was it stressful? Yes. Did we run out of money to live on? Yes all the time, for many years with each child. Dowie was 10 months old when we started shooting Proof. In the NFSA, there is a crew photo of the Proof team. Sitting with the gaffers and grips, boomies and the camera team are PJ, Dowie and Nanny Ruth. I considered my nanny part of the film crew, and I still do. Today, not much has changed when it comes to the cost of childcare. There have been many times the cost of childcare has used up a considerable amount of what I will earn for a job. Some people have asked me, then why do it? Why spend so much on childcare to work in a job where you will end up with barely enough for yourself? Well, I do have a number of questions, uh, answers to those questions. A, I work in the film and television industry, so yes, I am slightly crazy, in a good way. B, I don't mind paying good money to a quality carer who will look after my precious children. I don't want them to simply babysit my kids. I want them to love them and inspire them and teach them. I want my kids to benefit and be inspired by the people who care for them. Knowing they are in such good hands helps me do my job well. If I do my job well, I get more jobs. Movies hire a lot of people, more jobs all round. C, this directing job that I am earning less for today is an investment in my future career. In my future career, I will make more money and be able to afford childcare without it meaning such a huge loss in my income. That is my hope anyway. Eventually my kids will be older and need less care and I will be able to save some money. Eventually in the freelance world, one job leads to another. 
and that's what you have to think about. Now, I still believe this. I did some cal calculating last week. The average pre-production and shooting schedule for a director comes to around 22 weeks, not counting time spent at festivals or on publicity tour or post. With my average daily hours being 8 to 6, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., with shooting much longer, I will need a lot of childcare. Sometimes shooting weeks go for six days, not five, with only one day off. If I will be away overnight or shooting all night, which happens a lot, I will need childcare for another 14 hours a day. Now my husband PJ also works full time, so we really can't rely on him for all the childcare backup. Like me, he's a working parent. There are no grandparents living, and my brother and sister live in an interstate. If I want to work, which I do, it costs me still a lot of money to do so. Sometimes a job is interstate or overseas. Now I can choose not to accept the job and then lose a career opportunity or accept the job which takes me away from my kids for a long, long time. In this case, I will need a full-time carer for the whole time I'm away. Now, these days in 2018, two of my kids are profoundly disabled and complicated. So just handing them over to an untrained carer, that's not an option. In fact, my kids need two carers. The total amount for childcare for a 20 week job is, well, way more than I can really afford. Luckily in the past couple of years, the National Disability Insurance Scheme has come into being and is financially helping to pay for the, carer, the carers to care for my disabled kids. But for some reason, Jack doesn't get any carers on Sundays. They won't pay for that. Try telling autism that. <laughs> hey, autism, you really need to take Sundays off because I don't have any help on Sundays. No, seriously, the NDIS funding is an enormous relief and a huge help to people with disabilities. It is a nightmare of paperwork and assessments every six to 12 months, but it is definitely a step in the right direction. When my eldest daughter, Lily, was diagnosed with autism back in 1997. I had just finished directing A Thousand Acres, starring Jessica Lange, Michelle Pfeiffer, Colin Firth and Jason Robarts. Lily was about two, two and a half. Dowie, who had now officially changed his name to Spike, was five. <laughs> PJ had finished directing My Best Friend's Wedding. And we had a three year deal with Sony Pictures. We were living in America, fielding offers and feeling on top of the world. Then autism hit and we were given the news that I would have to stop work and care for Lily full time, not only as her loving mummy, but as her full time 24 seven therapist and teacher. I was the only human being she responded to. So of course, I did not hesitate to throw myself full time into helping her. Autism parenting, what is parenting? Like any parenting of a chronically ill or overwhelmingly complicated child is what I call extreme parenting. I learned a lot about child development, language acquisition, emotional evolution and neurobiology more than I ever imagined that I would. I organized a team of therapists to help Lily because I was not enough for her. She needed more than just me. She needed an army of therapists and carers to help her cope with her day to day needs. Lily had to have six hours of therapy every day, six days a week, just to learn how to say simple sentences and to be able to wash her own hands and learn how to use the toilet. Once again, the cost of these therapists were paid for by the one working parent, PJ, and me. We, we have a joint account. <laughs> Luckily, PJ's movie, My Best Friend's Wedding, was a worldwide hit. It made hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office, which meant he was offered everything. And so he managed to make a lot of money, which was mostly spent on Lily's very expensive therapy. Back then, not even DGA insurance paid for autism treatment. The families had to pay for it. After a few years, the American film critic, Elvis Mitchell, wrote an article in the New York Times with all my friends sent to me, including my agent. I don't know why, because in the article he asked, Whatever happened to Jocelyn Morehouse, the Australian director of Proof? Has her career nosedived? Well, it hurt. So I wrote to him and I told him, well, I'll tell you what happened. I'm a carer. But 
and that I did fully plan on going back to work when my daughter was further along in her treatment. <laughs> it was childish of me to write that letter. Of course, he didn't care one way or the other. But I just felt so forgotten and invisible. What I was doing with Lily was very important and I was impassioned about helping her. All my creative thinking went into her now and how to help her blossom. In 2003, I was blessed with another child, Jack. I also got offered a movie. It was called Eucalyptus. PJ and I moved with our kids back to Australia to start location searching. We brought nannies and therapists with us. We trained local therapists to help Lily. We found a great autism school in Gladesville called Giant Steps that Lily could go to. Linda House came on board the film with the Italian producer, Alberto Pasolini. I was still breastfeeding baby Jack, even though Alberto would express distress when I brought Jack to production meetings. <laughs> it was very upsetting for him. And he kept asking me, when are you gonna wean that baby? And I would say, well, when he's ready. Now I would nurse Jack while my creative team, of Janet Patterson and Mandy Walker and others, we would sit around discussing costumes and lighting and none of it was de you know, delayed by Jack. <laughs> um, so he got his nutrition and I got to do my preparation. My nanny and PJ came along on the location scouts to look, uh, yeah, to look after Jack so I could concentrate on my job and still breastfeed him on breaks. Jack would make funny baby sounds in the back of the car while we drove through country New South Wales. Mark Turnbull was my first AD and he loved Jack and he would laugh at the various sounds Jack would make. Things were looking up again, <laughs> but it was not to be. The film fell through as they do and Jack by 2005 had an autism diagnosis of his own. It would not actually be until 2015 that I would find myself back in the director's chair. Producer Sue Maslin had always loved proof and she'd never forgotten it. I was living back in Los Angeles with both Jack and Lily now at specialist autism schools and they were also in intensive therapy. Now I was first approached about the dressmaker by a different producer, Emma Cooper, and I had said no to Emma because I was so enmeshed in two kids with autism <laughs> and I was once again mummy therapist. Um, then Sue got hold of the rights and approached me as well. Now even after I said no, no, I can't possibly make this film, I have two kids with autism, I now have a new baby girl that I'm still breastfeeding, Sue would not give up. I had practically given up myself on having a career again. But Sue patiently kept pushing me, read the book, just read the book, I know you're gonna love it. Uh, think about it, and this went over about two years. <laughs> Finally, I read the book, I loved it, and I realized I still desperately wanted to direct again. Just like Linda had all those years ago, Sue saw me as a talented woman she wanted to work with. When it came to production, Sue made sure there was a special amount for childcare in the dressmaker's budget. It was originally around 42,000, but after some unforeseen budget issues, I told Sue to take some of that amount away to pay for her things that needed to be paid for in the film. Uh, so I was left with $19,000. It helped, but it wasn't, you know, it, it, it was great that she did that. What an amazing thing. It had never happened to me uh, in my director as a career, uh, in my directing career, sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit sleep deprived. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, thanks Sue, that was amazing. And hopefully we'll see more productions doing that. I would not have had a career and the dressmaker would never have been made if I had not had the support of open-minded producers and the parenting partnership I have with my husband PJ. And also, without the incredible support of the many carers who have nurtured and protected my darling children all these years. I am no less a mother because I hire carers to look after my children when I'm unable to do so myself. And I'm no less a film director or writer because I have kids. Becoming a mother has made me stronger, smarter, more capable, and much more skilled than I was when I was childless. I am a master at multitasking. I am brilliant with conflict resolution. I have way more sensitivity and a much bigger sense of humor. I believe there is a need for the nurturing and caring of children to not just be a mother's concern or a father's. It should be society's concern. If there are initiatives in place to safeguard the well-being of our children, then society as a whole will become more inclusive, 
More parents will be leaders and more women will be in positions to influence laws and change public perceptions. The female voice will grow stronger. Nurturers will have more power, and that's got to be a good thing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, and um, thank you for being so brave and sharing your experiences with us. Um, all right, so uh, we'd now like to call on our next panel, The Case for Action, to come up and join us. The moderator is Georgie McLean. Hi, Georgie. Um, and I'd like to welcome Emma Walsh, uh, Janine Brederhoft, and Tanya Teague to come up to talk. You'll be moderating. Um, and I just have a quick announcement. We do have another slight change to the program. Uh, we won't be hearing from Sally Regan at Create New South Wales, but, so we'll be having our afternoon tea break at about 1.45. Um, please join me in welcoming the panel and Georgie. In the interest of time while we welcome Emma to the stage. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> dramatic interest. A lot of care. <laughs> oh, we all care. Here we are. Um, so, I'm, as Monica said, I, I'm Georgia McLean. I'm the Head of Strategy and Governance here at Afters. Um, I'm also a mum. I'm in it. I, my, my youngest just turned two on Monday. Um, and she has just recently been accepted on the NDIS as well. So, we're in, we're in it. Um, I have a hugely supportive workplace here. There's been lots of different rooms in this building where I have expressed breast milk, so if there's, if there's a bit of a funk in the air, that could be why. Um, and I also have a true co-parent in my partner who also works in the industry, but I'm really tired. I think we all are in this room. I think there's been a lot of holding up, and I'm hoping this panel has some of the answers for us. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about 30 years today. Um, 30 years ago there was another pub key publication. It was Marilyn Waring's seminal work in feminist economics about um, the impact of women's caring work in, in, um, to society and the limitations of understanding GDP. It was published as If Women Counted and then later republished as Counting for Nothing, What Men Value and What Women Are Worth. Um, a lot of the kind of discussion there was about how caring work holds up our economy and we are still 30 years on and we are still not there in that conversation. So we're hoping that some of the work that done, that's done here can help kind of move us forward in the right direction. We know women carry a lot more of the domestic load than men. A lot of us would have read the wife drought that gave us all the stats on that, drawn from the ABS and Time Use Diaries. But it's not just the time. It's also what the kind of contemporary next wave of feminism is talking about in terms of emotional labour. And it's that knowing your kid's shoe size, knowing what to take to the Christmas concert. It's the worry, it's the thinking, it's the doing all the paperwork for the NDIS. It's, the, no, it's remembering the names of all your friends, your kids' friends' parents. It's not being the one who doesn't show to the concert. It's all of that work. Um, and it's really important and it takes up so much headspace. Um, so, you know, I'd imagine that if we were all relieved from those responsibilities just for a day, we could have so many epiphanies or at least a bit of a rest. Um, so to shed some light on these and many other questions, we have a fabulous panel with us today. We, next to me, we have Janine um, Bredehoft, who's from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, who have, uh, she, Janine leads the team that is responsible for the fabulous data set we have around insights, um, resource of data and insights, including that unfortunately enraging uh, but hugely mobilising fact that the gender pay gap is still at 21.3 per cent, even though there has been a little bit of action in recent years, but it's still ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, we also have with us um, Tanya Teague, who is from Care, who's uh, representing Carers New South Wales today, and she's here to talk about the range of forms of caring that we're trying to address um, and perhaps sh um, bring to the for in the conversation a little more. This is not just about kids. Tanya cares for her mother who has a, has a degenerative condition affecting her motor skills and she juggles this with part-time work and she's gonna talk a little bit more about her experience on that today. Um, and also we have with us Emma Walsh who is the CEO and founder of Parents at Work. Um, and they, that organisation aims to support not only mums and dads, but also their organisations to better manage the challenges of juggling work and family, creating a family-friendly future. And perhaps we can talk about how far we are from that today as well. So we're going to start with the data. We're going to start with you, Janine. And do, do you want to speak a little bit um, about the work you do in your area and how this industry tracks against 
other industries. Um, so we as the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, we collect data from private sector organizations and they have to have 100 or more employees um, in order to report to us on an annual basis. And they do so by reporting a workplace profile and um, filling out a little questionnaire. Um, and that asks what's the workforce composition, you know, in terms of gender, where do women and men work in terms of their occupations, but also management roles. Um, and we ask whether organisations have policies and practices that support gender equality overall or support family um, employees with family and caring responsibilities. Um, so organisations fill out this, um, this questionnaire to do, to do so. And um, well, we then crash the data in our team on an annual basis and sort of release it in, in our, our, our profile. And overall, what we have seen, there is some progress. We've seen the gender pay gap going down, and we do know that um, more and more organisations do have flexible working policies, for example. So, but that's an, on an overall average. I've had a quick look at the film industry, and um, on our data explorer, there is more information because I can't hope of obviously remember all the data that we have. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the film industry is a little bit of a tricky industry, as we've heard before in the panel. And there's, in, there's a lot of freelance work, there's a lot of casual um, workforce that might not be really um, even uh, able to, ac to access, for example, employer paid parental leave. And the industry generally fares a little bit lower in terms of the, what policies and practices there are, um, so lower than the average, than the Australian average, I would say. Mm. Yeah. A bit bleak. A bit bleak. But are we seeing trend lines there as well in terms of the screen industry? Yeah, we're seeing trend lines. Um, we're seeing overall trend lines going in the right direction. And we know that if um, organisations have policies, for example, if they or if they do conduct a gender pay gap audit mm. and if they then act on it, we know that gender pay gaps can go down. And we see that this is a trend overall as well as in the screen as well in the screen industry. And so what are those interventions that you've seen have an impact? Okay. Particularly doing an analysis. Yes. <laughs> Some organisations do an analysis and then don't action it. So right. we talk about the action gap. Um, but actions such as even, you know, looking at are there any sort of like for like pay gaps, as we call them, or is, do, 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 do organisations actually have equal pay for equal value or comparative value? Mm -hmm to fix those um, pay gaps, that's what we, we were asking them to do. And also report the metrics to the board and the leadership. If leadership and boards don't know about this, then uh, often organisations don't action. And we really need leadership buy-in to sort of continue and to action these, um, to implement policies right. and to action it. It's that responsibility of the data that Deb mm. was talking about. Once you know, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. if you don't know, you don't know. Excellent. So I might, I might draw on you next, Emma, from Parents at Work to kind of follow on from there to tell us a little bit more about the work of your organisation and, and what you've discovered. You've got, I believe you've got some slides to share with us about yeah. the snapshot. Oh, shall I? Cue <laughs> um, Well, thank you very much for having me here today. And I think it's fantastic that we're having this conversation because like Jocelyn, I just wanted to acknowledge your story that really touched me and I, I think I didn't have a dry eye and I'm, not, I'm pretty sure no one else did. Um, and because your story is not unusual, actually, and we don't talk about this enough and really what Parents at Work is trying to do is to have these conversations much more openly, um, to work with organisations to recognise the challenge that exists around how do we help people con to combine work and family responsibilities because we all have unique challenges, um, we all have unique ambitions and plans for our lives, for our families, for our careers and then this thing happens called parenthood and suddenly nothing goes to plan. Um, these things that Jocelyn was talking about, these twists and turns in our life and how do we respond to them and all the while just trying to earn a living and get bills paid and feed children and love children and the challenge of that is absolutely a society problem. Mm -hmm. It's not just a workplace problem, it's not an individual problem and we can all be involved in solving it and it doesn't matter whether you're a parent or not because we all belong to families that want and need us and deserve us and we deserve them too. Um, so this is actually a much more of a, you know, this is not a working parent or even carer story, this, this involves all of us. Um, so Parents at Work uh, came about 
again, a personal story because I worked in an industry that I just did not see any female leaders that, you know, role model the success of balancing work and family. I worked in-house in largely professional services and financial services industries and I saw how poorly people were treated when they came back to work, um, the compromises that they had to make around family and career, and I saw people either sidelined completely because they were only wanted to work part-time mm. and therefore they could have the back office doing something boring, or those that broke through the glass ceiling and were doing more senior positions, well, they had to pretend that they didn't have a family. And I didn't want either of those stories to be my story. So um, we started really Parents at Work as a social enterprise. In the beginning, it was very much about helping mums just break back into the workplace, get the career coaching that they needed, the basic resume skills that they needed, um, a basic website at the time. There was nothing in Australia where mothers could go to try and educate themselves to get back in. Um, that quickly grew and then over time we embraced, as we should, all parents, so uh, really talking to fathers as well. And today what we do is really, we hope we are and continue to be the leading voice for pe working parents in organisations and really getting organisations engaged in the conversation of what's really happening for their people when they show up to work every day. What's on their minds, what's actually getting in the way of being, them being able to be their best self um, and what are some of those challenges? So, am I might, what slide have we got up? Yeah, modern working parent. So, um, I thought this would be a really, I think, a sobering slide for all of us. It makes us pause for a moment to really understand <coughs> what is it that's going on in the everyday lives of people that come to work, particularly those with uh, young children and uh, also caring for relatives. This is the common scenario, this, and that's a pretty sobering list of things that people are actually having to deal with on a regular basis. And that's not including the stories like Jocelyn, where you know that's just tenfold if you've got children who are sick um, or with a disability, and the same for ageing parents. Um, but that's the common story around what most people who have got young children are facing every single day. And it's pretty sobering because it makes us reflect that somehow, when all that's going on, we're actually trying to be productive and we're trying to get a job done and we're trying to produce a film or whatever it is we're trying to do. And really I look at that list and I go, I don't know how we haven't lost it by the end of each day. And that we've got the, you know, the wherewithal to get up and do it all again the next day. And to the childcare comment that you made, well, it's doubled in the last 10 years at least. You know, my, one of my colleagues with work um, was forced into a local childcare centre because she moved and it was the only one that she could get and even though we're really flexible, she wanted to care for a couple of days a week. It's $190 a day. Wow. It's ridiculous. I mean, and, you know, subsidy runs out pretty fast and we did what we could as a small business to help her and, of course, family are welcome all the time. But these are the real challenges that, that people are facing, the choices they have to make every single day just to get to work and then show up and try and do a good job and go home and face it all again tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, that, that's... So, can I jump in there mm. and ask, what, when you're talking to workplaces about the case mm -hmm. for engaging with this, what, what's your sell? What are you saying that parents bring to, 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 the, to mm. productivity? And how do you... Obviously, it's, it is really challenging. It's genuinely yeah. challenging. How, what, what, what do you talk about with workplaces to get them on board to help understand? Like, well, data. Data. Yeah, yeah, they love yeah, data. Yeah. Um, they need to see the statistics. They need to see, um, show me how that turns up in our workplace as a problem. And so we talk about levels of engagement. Look, luckily, um, uh, there's been lots of research done. You know, there's, uh, look, you look at people like Ariana Huffington, who leads the world on the importance of well-being, you know, and how important it is to get great sleep and, you know, all the work that she's been doing more broadly around getting organisations to embrace wellbeing for their people, and this, this comes as part of that story, um, is to bring the stories um, to them. So to be able to say, for example, when we work with them, let's do a pilot, let's just find out what people really are feeling for you. Before you commit to anything, let's find out just what's going on. Let's do a focus group. Let's get some evidence about what's working and what isn't in your organisation before you do anything. because. You know, you really want to make sure you understand the unique needs of your organisation. So actually, their people sell it for us because 
they then come forward with you know lots of their thoughts and concerns and ways that could be done better. Um, so a lot of it is about starting with some focus groups, gathering the evidence, getting the data. We work very closely with Wajia yeah. to really um, give them the evidence they need and let their people tell the story about what's actually needed to change. And can you make yeah. the case for the kinds of things that Jocelyn was talking about? That increase in emotional intelligence, that capacity to multi-skill, like all of those things that yes. being a parent teaches you yes. and make the case for that in workplaces oh. and what that kind of brings to the table? Absolutely. Yeah. Now that, you know, um, for those people that are parents in the organisation that are in the leadership roles, they get that actually. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they're living and breathing that. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always the case because you know those that don't have children haven't yet seen or experienced the develop the personal development that comes with being a parent yep. so sometimes there isn't an awareness that that's actually a real benefit mm -hmm. so I would say in half the workplaces you know you've got a half and half mix which is actually what drives this challenging culture if you like because then you've got a whole host of people in the workplace that well we don't have children so you know mm -hmm. Well, why are they getting a benefit to yeah, come back yeah. and is that really all we're seeing is that they get to leave at four o'clock how's that fair mm -hmm. you know so it's about really mainstreaming flexibility and mainstreaming yeah. um, mainstreaming this but you're absolutely right they're all skill sets that people bring back of course because parenting is about nurturing a child and and a family and um, you know really helping them be their full potential and frankly that's leadership yeah absolutely that's what you do with the team. I might bring Tanya in now to talk about the other side of caring or, or, or a more kind of holistic sense of caring. And obviously in parenting, one of the things that you generally look forward to is that this you move through different stages and that your kids become more and more independent over time. But that's not necessarily the case when you're caring for someone like your mum, obviously, Tanya. Well, how does that kind of, how does that make you think about the caring role and what some of the differences might be? Yeah, well, like a... a carer in my situation, you don't plan to be a carer. No. Um, when you're a parent, you mm. plan that there's going to be an element of care. Yeah. Um, mm. But you, you know, growing up, you think your parents are going to retire, they're going to go on holidays, cruises, this kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> um, and so you don't expect to have that role reversal and to be quite so dramatic. Um, with the independent side of things, I've found with mum, it's about reframing what independence is. Yeah. So these days she is in a wheelchair. So she has had to change her expectations of what she can do. And my role, what I see my role to be is to, how do I help her, I guess, re-engage with her abilities within that? Yeah. We've found technology is amazing. Um, what is fun for me, like using Google Home, <laughs> is great for mum. She now can yeah. turn lights off and on by herself, yeah. um, yeah. put a fan on. Small things like that are just really big wins. Yeah. And um, it's, as I said, it's about reframing what independence is for mum. Um, not being able to go out independently, it's, there are services available. Finding those services and tapping in can maybe be the struggle. Yeah. But it's um, putting your hand up and just saying, I need help. And then um, finding that help for mum so that she can get out, can engage, see her friends, um, experience new things. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's about helping her with that journey as well. Um, and does the burden of coordinating all of that fall with you? Are there, are there resources that outside the family that can assist with that as well? Because so much of it is about remembering passwords and managing and being on the phone mm. for 15 minutes while you wait for the call centres. Thankfully there are some yeah. um, um, services out there which do allow me to be a representative for mum. So my aged care is our service, not NDIS. Yeah. Um, and so I have my own reference number, which is great, so that I can independently call. I don't have to have mum with me to say I give a permission for yes. my daughter to make these uh, inquiries. Yeah. So one thing I should mention is my mother has a, a stutter and stammers when she speaks, so is quite uncomfortable when she speaks, so yeah. often I do speak for her. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I am able to, with her care providers, so her paid care workers, she coordinates that. However, if there are phone calls, I will step in. Uh, and again, it's making that time. Um, I mean, I was up till early hours like one day last week just composing a message for mum and putting it into a government speak, I guess. Yeah. There were some issues. So again, learning how to advocate. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that my um, experience is in government. Yeah. And so just knowing how to use the language back again, yeah. I think it's tough at the best of times. Yeah. And so when uh, for my mother, who um, is just generally struggling with confidence, and with she feels she can't do anything to 
enable her to see that actually you can and you have a lot of rights. Yes. Um, and so it's exercising that and showing her that she can do it um, yeah. and often just being supportive. Um, and then there are small things like going shopping. Um, yeah. Sometimes I will leave mum to make purchases on her own. It's easier, of course, if I were to be there and do all the transactions. But I see it as, a, I guess, a training exercise for the person on the other side mm -hmm. of the counter as well to interact with mum, to normalise the situation and mm -hmm. just make it every day. Yeah. So it's there a small was a recent, um, uh Katja Malikas, who works for Starting with Julius and um, is a disability advocate involved in the Attitude Foundation, recently published something about um, living in the bubble and the bubbles we live in. And there was a um, case apparently recently where somebody complained about being put next to a young girl with Down syndrome on the plane. And he said, oh, you know, I can't believe you're sending me here. Why do I have to deal with this? And she spoke a lot about that bubble of experience that most of us live in where we don't have to engage with people with different needs. So that kind of learning experience that you were talking about is really important mm -hmm. for this conversation about sharing needs. So not hiding the kids, not hiding the people with different needs. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is really key. Thank you for that. Um, Emmy, you were going to talk a little bit too about entitlements as well. Sorry, can we go back to that next slide, Alan? <laughs> Sorry, you've only just brought it down. Here we are. Sorry, Megan. <laughs> I'm going to talk about three things um, just in case that was useful and these um, I think it's an li like anything <laughs> the legal entitlements quite complicated <laughs> a bit like trying to apply for NDIS or you know going filling in those forms that you were just talking about um, but there are some basics that I think uh, were useful just to know about and you can go and obviously make sure later that these actually do apply to you if they're um, of interest so the National Employment Standards um, that came in in 2010 really, which also supported when the new paid parental leave scheme came in at the same time, um, this idea that working parents should have some minimum basic rights. Um, and there's a couple of key ones to point out. One is that, that reminder that you are entitled to your old role back. Once you've been on leave and are coming back into the workplace, you have a right to the role that you occupied before you went on leave. Now, depending on your employment status and whether you're a contract worker, casual or permanent, those entitlements can, can obviously be tighter than others and it's important to look at your employment contract um, and that of your status and what you're entitled to. But generally, that is the case for full-time, um, part-time, um, permanent uh, employees are entitled to that. Um, there is also the opportunity and the right to request flexibility. So if you've got a child up until um, the age of 18, particularly if they've got a dis disability, you do have the option to uh, request the flexibility and your employer must show reasonable um, evidence if they decline that offer. So the idea is that the government is expecting that you will be offered the flexibility that you've asked for unless the business can uh, evidence that that isn't going to work. Mm. And I think that's really important to remember because there's lots of people who, well, I see two problems, mostly one, the individual themselves who rule it out, going, oh, I just can't see it working flexibly, so I just won't go there. I won't mm. attempt to even try that conversation or I just know my manager won't support it. Mm -hmm. So they kind of rule it out themselves before it's even been tested. Yeah. And then there's obviously the, those that do go and ask and when the manager goes, yeah, look, I'd love to do that, but nah, it's not going to work. Um, at that point, just going, oh, okay, yeah. thanks anyway for listening, you know, and don't know where to go further with that. And yes. the, the, the reality is you can go like, further. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and my advice would be if you get a no, then go back and say, okay, well, look, how about you go away, I'll go away, we'll have a think about that. And let's re-meet <laughs> next week and have a discussion about how we can find an arrangement that's going to work for us both, yeah. right? Um, because it's in their interest too, it's in your interest too. Mm. And yeah, so th they're the key things. Was there one more? I said, yeah, obligation to stay in touch. That's another one oh, yeah. that often is forgotten. Throughout the, term Throughout term. the leave, yeah, yeah, they do have an obligation to keep in touch with you. Um, and that's often not understood well by employers and again some leaders can go well I, I think I'll just wait to hear from them yeah because I don't that's want to impose yeah. yeah 
So, did, did, we, did we see, so obviously these are all, everyone's entitlements. Um, in, does the data bear out the fact that these are being taken up? And also, what are the, what are the changes that we've seen since 2010 with those new, that new paid parental leave scheme coming in? Have we seen a big impact, an uptick? Um, so there's two different things. To f when we collect data on flexible working, we do not collect utilisation. Oh, right. <laughs> Partly, you know, we would like to change it. Well, let's see if we can get it up. However, we know from research that it's particularly men who do not ask, and if they ask, they do not get. Mm -hmm. So, and I think if we think about, well, there is an unpaid care, sort of it's disproportionately taken over by women. Women do one and one hour and 46 minutes while men do one hour a day. So there is really room for men to step up. And as the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, we really want to encourage men to actually take flexible working, to take over share of that unpaid care work, you know, whether it's for family members or for children. And I think workplaces need to um, sort of implement some sort of targets for men to take parent, a flexible working mm. arrangement, for example. Mm. So that's sort of what we promote as an agency. With parental leave, it's a little bit different. We, we do not look at the government scheme. Our parental leave covers empl additional employer-funded parental leave. And there we know that only about 47.8% of organisations do have employer-funded paid parental leave. I'm not so sure about the data in, in your industry mm. now. However, that has stalled over the last four years. So we really are, we're really trying to promote that. And also we do collect utilisation data here and we know that only about 5%, under 5% of men are actually uptaking this kind of leave. Yeah. So even if it's available to them, they're not taking it. And it's like, why? <laughs> what can we do to change the culture around care being something that is only sort of women's work, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do we see that in Carers New South Wales and in the network that you're part of, Tanya? How many how many men do you see phoning up and saying, "Yes, I'm a carer. I care for my parents." I so. believe that's increasing. Yeah. Um, and there are um, there's a, a push towards more support for men mm -hmm. to I'm not going to say band together, but to um, put their hand up to acknowledge that they are a carer because yeah. one of the things that is happening now is there are a lot of hidden carers, uh, people who don't put their hand up to say I am a carer it's just a, an assumed role yes. um, and so I'm a carer representative so I don't have um, a, a lot of contact I guess oh. with a, a bunch of carers but from my experience and talking to a few others um, um, I've encountered quite a lot of carers who don't reach out to networks um, maybe in my local community um, and I will try and push them to these support groups that I'm uh, I'm aware of so I share the caring responsibility with my father as well and he was probably one of the first people where I said there's there's actually counseling support for you yeah. um, put him in contact with some men's groups yeah. with the counseling support um, and then yeah there are others so I do my own respite just from self-care and um, again I've come across other people who are in this hidden um, and I don't know if it's a male thing to not want to ask for help uh, or to see it, they see it as a sign of weakness, but yeah. um, I think there's that push as well to um, open that conversation and again to normalise it. It's really, mm. as you were saying, very mm. much part of society mm. to, mm. Um, to normalise it. Mm. Mm. So you touched in on self-care. How do we self-care as carers? I know there's some pretty scary stats about this industry that, that Entertainment Assist put out about mm -hmm. 10 times the level of anxiety mm -hmm. to the broader population, like double the suicide attempts. It's pretty kind of, you know, mm -hmm. horrific statistics about the entertainment industry and mm -hmm. it sort of touches on what you were saying, Deb, about the industry. Um, how, how do we self-care as carers and how do we access support for, how do we nurture the nurturers amongst us? Well, um, I love the um, the saying that you can't pour from an empty cup. Yeah. Mm. So you really do need to step out, step away from that caring role, and just look after yourself. Otherwise, you really can't care for somebody else. Mm. And um, so, depending on your needs, uh, it could be going for a long walk. It could be engaging in um, gardening, reaching out to. Um, friends go listen to music um, for me I started to do more sport uh, anyway ended up being a bit of a disaster when I broke my hand but anyway but again it, it just um, you I one of the things that I learned was to put my hand up yep. um, that it was fine to put my hand up to say I'm not coping 
and to move, really move forward from there. Um, and that's how I found about found out about a counselling service. So there's a, a National Carers Counselling Program, which gives you six sessions with a counsellor in your local area. And it's a face-to-face -face session if you want as well. Yeah. Um, and that's, for me, that was a big start. Um, Cause as I said, didn't expect to be a carer, just happened. Um, and um, yeah, um, being able to acknowledge the, um, I guess, I don't want to call it a weakness, but to um, to acknowledge that you need help and to yeah. to make that that step forward. What about mm. parents, Emma? How does that work? Yeah, it's funny. I just wrote an article this week about this oh, this idea of thing. caring fatigue, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because it's often this time of year where I feel it. Mm. I'm clearly feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> Rolled my ankle yeah. on um, Monday running. Yeah. Maybe different exercise would <laughs> yeah, be a yeah. good one. Um, but this idea, because we do lots of coaching of parents all year, we do hear lots of stories, like any counsellor or coaching service, you hear lots of difficult stories all year and you get reminded of how much giving you're giving at this mm. time of year because this is amplifies with Christmas and yeah. all the additional things you need to do to care for everybody, that everyone wants something of you. And um, so... Again, I have a saying around, why not give yourself the love you so freely give to others? You know, And when you do that, then you have actually got more in the bucket to give to others. And we need to remind ourselves of that. And so I think um, this time of year in particular, you know, it's that concept of just reflecting on the caregiving you've been giving all year. Yeah. Just what energy you've been giving to things. Uh, has that been giving back to you or has it been draining you and just doing a little bit of a caring audit yep. on, okay, how am I going to set myself up for next year so that I don't give away my energy so freely on things that are not filling my bucket? Yep. And what is it, I agree with you, um, if surrounding yourself with people that are going to be energy givers, helpers, whatever it might be, yep. is really important. And, um, yeah, it's not, I, I know it's not easy and that's actually what I write about in the article. Yeah. I haven't mastered it yet at all. And, yeah. I mean, not that this is our conversation to have as women, but what can be done about this 5% of men? I mean, it's a real mm. problem. I mean, to be fair, I've got to say, we put my husband's name down as the primary contact for childcare. They still ring me. I don't know why. Yeah. And that still happens. There is this sort of cultural thing that we need to shift on a very macro scale. Mm. And it is, you know, there's a, there's a real kind of problem, I think, in acknowledging that issue. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. We have to wrap up. I'm being told. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panellists for their fabulous contributions today. Sorry. Thank you so much to our panel and to George. I'm afraid we don't have time for Q&A, but uh, the panellists will be around for those of you who are here in real life. Um, so we're going to have our afternoon tea break now here and for those of you watching at home, time to go out, meet each other, chat, remember to, you know, do a wee, have something to eat, it's very important. Uh, we'll be um, starting up again at five past two, uh, promptly to start talking about crash course in crèche essentials, which I will have to say very clearly in order not to stumble over my words. Um, enjoy your break and we'll reconvene soon.